Thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, Terry, I'll just tell you who's here. We've got um, Len, as you um, met before, Len Schuver from um, the SPE um, in Chicago. He also owns um, Schuver Enterprises and has been a long-standing member of the plastics industry, working with um, PVC and other areas since 1974. Um, yes, the Lawson, the business director and co-owner of, Mel- of Denmark Melitech, a, um, a polyolefin compounding company working with the PVC Free Blood Bags Consortium. Andrea Zacchinelli, uh, the technical director of leading Italian slave free PVC specialist compounds for Resilia Hem1, formerly owned by Arkema. And that's all we have so far. We're still waiting from a representative from Fenwell. And uh, Ole Grondal Hansen, the general manager of the PVC Information Council Denmark, who are partly funded by the European Council of Animal Manufacturers. So um, thank you very much for your time, Terry. And uh, if you'd like, to, I think everyone's very, very interested in your research on DHP and um, the associated tests that you've done on tissue and exposure to the, to the chemical. Okay. Well, let me begin. Um, Somewhat where I tried to begin a week or so ago, um, uh, and thanks to the vagaries of modern communications, I get cut off, I think, two or three times. Um, so, my interest in the EHP uh, really relates to its use in materials employed in proper corporeal circuits. Now, its corporeal circuits include things like uh, hemodialysis, hemofiltration, uh, and particularly in my area of research is use in ECMO and in how to do bypass. So, historically, one of the most common complications of how to do bypass, CTB, call it from now on, are post-operative inflammatory responses. And in some patients, these are significant and life-threatening, and may be the result of very subtle triggers um, associated with contact with the foreign surface of the heart-lung, uh, the CTB system. So we investigated for over a number of years, um, looking at the development of anti-inflammatory strategies, various things, use of different materials, uh, and also some ph- pharmacological interventions, um, for example, the use of atrocin and, and various other uh, therapies. But we also looked at the materials themselves, and um, but using a RAT model, we investigated the pro-inflammatory effect of the EHP. And our approach to that was quite simple. We constructed this all published work. Um, get the material that was published in artificial organs this work. And we connect the perfusion circuit to the caudal circulation of rats and we recirculated over a period of time, exposing different surface areas of DEHP plasticized material to, um, to the rat's caudal circulation. And we measured cells of inflammation in those animals, and in particular, uh, we measured the upregulation of the adhesion molecule CD11B on neutrophils and on those animals. And we found a near linear relationship between the sur- exposed surface area and upregulation of CD11B in those animals. Now, uh, to verify that was the presence of DEHP that was associated with that response. We removed DEHP from the surface of the PVC and we found considerable uh, moderation in the inflammatory effect um, for a delayed onset uh, of inflammation in animals in which we'd remove the DEHP. So we were pretty confident blood contact with the um, EHP itself and migration of EHP is associated with that inflammatory response. But the use of the animal model we know is controversial. Um, 
in an effort to verify these findings in the rat model, he cultured rat and human blood with DEHT. And we found a similar response uh, in both species. So we were fairly confident that um, the effect we were seeing in a rat somewhat mirrored an effect that we might see uh, in humans. So the next stage in the process was to try to determine where this GHP was going, and that's our latest work, uh, which is yet unpublished, but will be published soon, in which we use the same circuitry, um, and we prepare the DEHP plasticized uh, BBC sheet, uh, in the same way as we used in our previous work. So in this case, we had radio labeled DEHP in order that we could then investigate um, where that DEHP migrated to during uh, the exposure period. And the protocol was quite simple. We would do a 90 minute recirculation, sorry, 60 minute recirculation. Um, we would then cover the animals, we would harvest those animals over a period of time, up to 28 days. 28 days was the limit uh, of, our, um, of our license for this to work. So what we found on harvesting uh, the organs and in, um, uh, in doing scintillation counting on those materials was that um, the level of DHP in those tissues, the brain, the heart, kidneys, uh, the lungs, and the gut, uh, some skin and some muscle, decay over the first two to three days and would then plateau out to 28 days. So we also harvested feces and urine, probably unpleasant process, I might add, and, um, and we could monitor the excretion of DHP and DHP kicked down product uh, in, in the uh, urine and feces. Uh, and that ends up in fact to last for a few days. Um, so we were quite confident that um, DHP was going to tissues, and sure we found relatively high concentrations in the brain and in the liver and that it stayed there and it stayed there up to 28 days and this for us is quite a significant finding and, and the fact that we have relatively significant con we have significant concentrations at two days I think is quite significant because it tends to suggest um, that those patients and this again is done in rats recognise that so two days is a normal dialysis cycle, and um, clearly, to extrapolate that data, it's conceivable that we get uh, a multiplication of DHP concentration in those organs with this two-day dialysis cycle. And this is something that we propose to investigate going forward, both using animal models and, if possible, using some historical issues we have access to here in the Glasgow um, it's the National Society based here in Glasgow. So, in summary, the findings are that in early studies, DHP is in itself pro inflammatory, but we're pretty confident that that's the case. Our most recent findings suggest that DHP, DHP migrates into the tissues and stays there. Certainly not all of it, but a significant concentration is in those tissues. And there may be some significant implications from that if we bear in mind the pro inflammatory data that we have from DHP from earlier in multiple exposures um, to DH, for example, uh, in the dialysis setting. So that's where we're at um, to this day. Mr. Terry? Um, I don't know if anyone wants to start with any questions. Yes, yes, Sam, this is Len. I would like to maybe get started. Uh, 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 Professor Gurley, I, I, the question I had when I read some of the studies that um, you've just sort of reviewed in, in this discussion um, made me wonder if, if you've had as a control, I know that you said that you did a washed surface to eliminate the level of the EAC. Uh, 
has there been any other non GEH plasticized material used as a control? And the, and the reason I ask that is I worked over the years with a a researcher who uh, uncovered uh, an unexpected response for complement activation when uh, the blood would flow over any foreign surface. And that certainly led to the inflammatory response. And I'm wondering if perhaps we could rule out that a non DEHV surface uh, is not also responsible for the inflammatory response. That's a good question. And, and um, yeah, we have. We've looked at polyolefins, uh, non plasticized material. We've um, looked at non plasticized BBC. Um, and we found, uh, and you're quite right, when blood comes into contact with any material, there will be the initiation of some degree of inflammatory response. Nothing is 100% biocompatible. That's quite clear. But when we expose, when we compare the polyolefin material, for example, with EHP plasticized PVC and uh, plasticized PVC with the perfect DHP that the world of difference uh, in, in that comparison. So, you know, we're quite confident that we have efficient controls in place to be able to make the conclusion that you know, the presence of DHP is a significant contributor to the inflammatory response. Uh-huh. We're absolutely confident. And, you know, we've done further studies. We've looked at, um, you know, other uh, factors involved in the inflammatory response, you know, the um, interleukins, uh, TNF-alpha, various other markers of inflammation. Yes. And we've seen a similar response. Okay. Of course, EG pesticides were compared on DAP as material. And one thing that you mentioned that I, I was a little bit uh, surprised to hear is that the EHP that uh, was absorbed by the, or, or became uh, uh, part of the brain and the, I think you said the liver, uh, stayed there for a long time. My, my uh, uh, information over the years has been, or my experience was that the EHP was cleared from the body rather quickly. I think it's cleared from the body rather quickly. Um, you know, providing it doesn't get into you know, the, the, the matrix issues. And you know, there's little doubt there's a, there's a significant residual level of DHP. Or DHP, a breakdown product, and let's be honest, we don't, don't know exactly what, we're not saying that that's DHP, but it's certainly associated with DHP that migrates from our breast tissue. It may well be a degradation product that we're looking at. And that, 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 that in actual fact, could be more hazardous in some ways, as, as you'll be aware. Yeah. Um, but we're certainly measuring significant residuals out to 28 days. Which then leads me to the next question. Um, it, it's recognizing that you are seeing a, a, um, a, a real uh, response. Uh, the question then, especially for, for users of, of uh, storage containers, where the DEHP is shown to have a beneficial effect, then the question becomes, at what levels does the DEAC begin to pose a risk? Because if, uh, if you look at the risk-benefit ratios of storage of red blood cells and the inflammatory response, are they similar in the exposure to the patient? That's the $64,000 question. <laughs> right. um, now let me, let me try and... Um, let me give you my... I mean, I fully recognize that published data supports the use of DHP plasticized blood bags. I think there's been significant studies over the years and, and significant numbers of studies over the years which suggest a stabilizing effect of DHP and slow blood draw. I fully accept um, but I think it's relatively low level and it's, um, you know, the level of migration, etc. But, as Sam will know, despite the data we have, I'm a real proponent of the use of DHP plasticized um, materials. 
in blood bags, and also currently in extraterrestrial circuits. And the reason I say that is that this allows me to know it. Has left the conference. The reason I say that is that in, um, you know, in general usage, uh, the deleterious effects of DEHP, I think, um, are, 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 you can couch them as alienated for the vast majority of patients. Mm-hmm. I'm talking from the CT perspective here. Um, however, there is a small proportion of patients for whom it might be significant, and that's those, those patients who are susceptible to exaggerated inflammation from just very small triggers. Right. And we know that makes up a small proportion, but um, it's clinically a very challenging uh, uh, proportion of patients undergoing DB procedures. I'm not at the ECMOs and the neonates. The neonates, and you know, there are a, rec- a recognized condition in open heart surgery. Um, it, 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 in a group of patients, cohorts of patients, who undergo a normal open heart surgical procedure, they may be young, they may be healthy, they may be fit, but after surgery, they go on to develop a substantial systemic inflammatory response. The so-called serve um, uh, response to open heart surgery. But those patients, presently, are unpredictable. They can't tell you. Who. I'm going to conference. And and in those patients, even a very small stimulus can go on to generate a surge type response. So we are concerned about that small cohort of patients. We also must remember that open heart surgery, there are many other significant and certainly much more substantial inflammatory stimuli than, than the DEHP itself. I, mean, I fully accept that. I'm, and I'm not, excuse me, my phone keeps ringing. I'm not particularly concerned um, about the use of DHP, uh in the CPD scenario. ECMO is a different scenario, you call it uh, ECLS, it's a different scenario altogether, but um, that's a, a, a time body mass surface area at the end of the scenario there, which is quite out of the norm uh, if, when, you, when you're looking at um, you know, CPD type setting. But when I am concerned about the use of DEA, it's not in, in large, relatively large, single setting. It's in multi-exposure. For example, in patients undergoing um, heated long-term dialysis. And those are the patients that I'm concerned about in, in terms of the findings we've had in our patch studies of the EHP migration in future. Because there's certainly significant, and those animals certainly significant residual levels of DEHP at two days out of 28 days, and as I said, two days would be roughly a normal um, dialysis cycle. Yeah. So we're getting repeated exposures over, in some cases, years. And now I'm not going to try and put the two together. It's impossible to tie them together at this stage. But there's certainly evidence that many of the long-term complications of dialysis are inflammatory in origin. And our, our renal physicians uh, will, to a man, verify that. Um, now, I can't, can't say at this stage that the DHP is the culprit, because these patients tend to have many, many comorbidities. Sure. But certainly... You know, the relationship between the presence of a, of a build-up of a pro-inflammatory molecule development inflammatory uh, um, complications, um, you know, there may be some link there. But, you know, we can't confirm that until, we've, until we or someone else has done further studies uh, on, on, on that. But that's, what, that's the area that concerns me. I'm not concerned, as I think Sam will confirm, we've had conversations about before, I'm not concerned with the use of DHE in blood bags. 
I'm not particularly concerned about the use of DHT plasticized materials in large single dose settings, for example, CDV. But I am concerned, and, and I'm concerned as a result of our recent studies about the use of DHT plasticized materials in multi exposure settings. So, in summary, that's, that's, that's my position in DHT. Very good, thank you. Maybe someone else has questions. Hi, if no one else has got one, I'd like to ask a, a question, Terry. Um, what's the, um, how, how would, how would a, a regulator, let's say, or someone making these kind of decisions, assess um, how, how to measure what's a safe and unsafe dosage of the EHP? Yeah, it's, I think we should have touched on that when you mentioned the $54,000 question. Um, it's incredibly difficult. Uh, it's incredibly difficult with the EHP, I think, because there are um, a number of studies which confirm that there are benefits in some settings uh, from the use of these plasticized materials, and, and the set, that setting is a one bag set. And you know, there's a raft of studies which uh, which bear out that potential benefit. Um, now, if you're asking me what what, what would be a, a, a level that would be a toxic level of DEHP, toxic by any measures, uh, from the from the inflammatory perspective, it's almost impossible to say. But, you know, you're dealing with. Um, Okay, it's a dose issue. It's a dose response issue. And the response, and we know this from, from open heart surgery, the response to a stimulus, um, such as DHT or other inflammatory stimuli, can vary enormously from patient to patient. And in general, I think it's over 60 years experience now, I'll tell you, it's over 60 years experience of the deployment of open heart surgery, to this day, in general, the inflammatory response to open heart surgery, let's just assume that all of that is associated with the um, presence of DHP plasticized materials. The level of that response post-surgery in most patients is insignificant. It's mild. Uh, some physicians will tell you it's akin to having a flu. Now, Having the flu in the ITU, given that your chest is pulled open and you're, uh, you're, you're festooned with all sorts of sedation lines and ventilation, etc., uh, is, is, a, is a minor insignificance. However, there is this cohort of patients who have an exaggerated boundary response to anything. So until we can identify who those patients are and perhaps offer them something which is not so inflammatory, then it's impossible to answer that question nor it really should be said. If, if, if I was asked the question, should we eliminate, uh, and I know this is sort of controversy around, I'm well aware of it, but if I'm asked the question, should we eliminate EHP plasticized materials uh, from extracorporeal circuitry, other than paralysis, that's a different argument, Metrocorial circuitry in the current financial climate, bearing in mind the level of challenge that it presents to the patients, I would probably say no. I think um, there are, you know, there's a pro inflammatory issue around DHT, but I think it's relatively insignificant in, in the routine, normal routine practice. And which products, would, um, which sort of specific areas do you think there is? Um, need for, you've already mentioned repeat dialysis, but are there any other products you need from there in the near nature? Yeah, I think definitely we should look at it in dialysis, in my view. And I think we need to have a very close scrutiny of DHP plasticized materials in the high surface area of mass applications such as uh, ECMO in neonates. I think those are two areas that require, in my view, some thorough attention. And are there um, established methods 
in those situations to assess the safe dosage, or is that an area that needs still needs to be uh, looked out? I think that requires further work. You know, just to, even just to establish a method. I think so. Right. Well, we can establish. We can establish. Um, we can establish the dose that these patients are receiving. That we can uh, can be measured. You know, to look at um, uh, you know, establishing what is a safe dose, I think there's a lot of work still needs to be done in that. The alternative would be just to say it's a problem, which replace it with something else. I'm just not sure. I'm not. I'm not convinced the normal routine practice that that's a viable argument. For a number of reasons, you know, both economic and clinical. So certainly, particularly for ECMO, there is a high blood surface area to body mass ratio, and in dialysis, where the surface area to body mass ratio is considerably smaller but is repeated, I think there's a need for further work and, and to establish it to, to what is a safe, uh, a safe dose. You know, uh, this is why the FDA recommended uh, caution when using the CDHP plus size PVC containers or tubing when infusing chemotherapy drugs because part of the uh, composition of the chemotherapy, at least for Texol, is a ethanol. And in ethanol, the alcohol would extract at very high levels the DEAP, resulting in uh, higher than normal exposure to the chemotherapy patient. And typically, they'll get uh, repeated uh, treatments of the chemotherapy drug, so caution was advised. In a, in a similar way for lipid, lipid emulsion patients, uh, the lipid emulsion would have a good affinity for the DEHP, resulting in a higher exposure to the patient. So, in, in the in, in the uh, uh, process of being most cautious, the precautionary principle is, is taken into account here, and the the, the surgeons uh, certainly are the ones that make the choice on what to use for the patient. Are cautioned to perhaps uh, use a non DEH plasticized uh, material for their infusions. Yep, and I think that's a sensible approach. And, yes, and it's based on. It's based on good science. Sure. But, um, I think there's, I think there's similar evidence, or there's certainly, certainly similar evidence in ECMO. Mm -hmm. There's a number of studies carried out both the USC and Japan, which suggest ECMO is the single, oh, sorry, you say that, is the largest single dose uh, of uh, DHP to any single patient. Um, and that's ECMO and neonates, where there is this exaggerated surface area to be um, sure. tissue. Sure. Um, and I think, maybe wrong, but I think some time ago, um, caution was um, was advised by the FDA with regard to the use of EHP plasticized materials, ECMO circuits for, for, for neonates. So, I mean, that's entirely sensible. Um, but I think folks need now to consider and what I think might be a more significant challenge, and that's the challenge of heated exposure. And I think that may be a significant problem. But we're at an early stage at the moment. You know, I, I suspect that it's a, it's a significant problem, but I don't know. And, and now it would specifically be, be the, the dialysis patients, whether it's CAPD or hemodialysis. I think so. Yes, I agree. I think so. And I think that really merits other investigations. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I, I think that's a concern. A genuine concern. But I, that time will tell. It's early days. Um, but, but, you know, time, time will tell. Uh, Terry, I don't, I don't want to cut amongst the pigeons here, but just to sort of, you know, Gut feeling, I suppose, um, or what's your uh, what's your intuition on this? But, you know, if, if DHP is showing sort of we're in, we're at early stages with a DHP um, plasticizer, you know, are there other chemicals out there that are used in 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 plastics and any other areas that you think might also, you know, sh require investigation? He was, you know, 
Who do you want to start? <laughs> well, maybe just focusing with plastics. So the whole host of areas. I really, you know, I, I'm happy to talk to you about um, THP, but we 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 looked at a whole host of other areas and um, from the inflammatory perspective. I think one of the questions and statements made earlier on in this conversation associates related to the complement cascade and and the blood exposure to any material um, initiates. Uh, the complement cascade. And that's absolutely right. I mean, I'm concerned about all materials you use in medical I know it's a ridiculous thing to say, but I, I, I'm concerned about all materials used in medical devices, particularly blood carrying medical devices. Um, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to um, list, list the culprit some. You know, um, I mean, we know that carbonate associated with initiation of inflammatory response, the whole host of materials associated with that. But I think the EHP is something that we can actually control. You know, we can easily do something about um, areas of editorial practice in which the use of EHP plastic materials comes to the norm. We can replace them, EHP. Some of the other materials are somewhat more difficult to replace. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, thanks. So what what sort of what, what are you what's holding back the release of your um It's in the mess. It'll be out. Um we had a moratorium in university on, on the full thesis. Um we're waiting for that to do it. People being submitted, um to submitted in due part. And we're waiting for um, for the final final uh, acceptance. And what, the basement. And what do you what do you need in order to be able to um, do the next stage on rats and the tissue, the human tissue that you mentioned? Well, the rat studies we want uh, that that's a funding issue. You know, we we um, we were constantly fighting for funding, as 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 you will know. And um, uh, he's been funding to support that work going forward. The human studies uh, would start with um, uh, hope to access um, human tissue bank, the historical human tissue bank, and access to which you would assay for levels of DHP in those tissues uh, on patients who are in long term dialysis. What tissue would you use? I'd use a brain. Brain? Yeah. Okay. Full form. Oh, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Unless I can find some volunteers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but we have a historical tissue bank. Um, mm-hmm. And it's a place to begin just to have a look and, and see if, um, you know, if we can identify uh, exaggerated DHP or not. In, in, in those patients. So that, that there, are, there are patients who've been on dialysis for 20 years. Um, and one anticipates if there's a, a, you know, a DHP migration issue, you will be able to identify it in those patients. So there's a lot of work that, um, of course, more from obviously, there's a lot of work have to do in terms of developing protocols, etc., around that. Uh, and we're still discussing that. Um, is that more of a sort of uh, an organisational thing that you need to get across rather than just a funding issue on the human tissue? Yeah, it's just, uh, it really is that. Um, the, the rat, the rat work is simply a funding issue and be aware that um, uh, in the current financial climate, funding is, is, is tight. Um, so, that's just a time to have a very good record of of raising funding for a research year, um, if you're patient enough um, and can can pose a strong enough argument, and we'll get the funding. The questions. Yeah, we work forward. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I don't know if anyone else has got any uh, further questions. I'm I'm fairly well well fed there. Does anyone want to raise anything? 
Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for your, your input, Terry. Uh, I'm aware that there were some people that weren't able to make it today, so um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll run past I'll run past what they want. If there's any questions they want to raise by email, I'll put them over to you. Right. But thanks for everyone's input. Wait, um, Sam, 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 before we go, I guess yeah. maybe just let me ask one thing. Sure, sure. I'll be able to ask for Andrea. Yeah. Uh, from the perspective of a supplier of alternate materials, uh, do you have any data that supports the the uh, movement to replace the EAP, other than what Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Gurley has mentioned? Uh, the, the problem is always uh, uh, in order to how can be uh, made the assessment, uh, because everyone uh, is asking for literature, evidence, and the protocols. Uh, at the end, uh, we have uh, no protocols, no evidence. Everyone is uh, working on his own and uh, mainly on what is uh, historically already done. The fact uh, actually is that uh, DAP in Europe is something that is going out uh, of the market, but we don't know which would be the replacement because there is only few studies on the alternatives uh, in uh, PVC pesticides. There is UTM that is uh, historically used, so there is a little bit of literature. Uh, there is uh, DINC that is a newcomer and have a, a little bit of studies, uh, and uh, also DHT that is uh, the other newcomer. But uh, everywhere, there, due to the fact that there is not a protocol, because it's difficult to define which is the uh, inflammatory aspect of level and so on on each uh, plasticizer, everyone is working on uh, evidences, and we have no evidences but on the fact that uh, this could be a problem. Yeah, I think if it says any kind of an extractable plasticizer, we could probably expect the same response um, to, to, uh, to that uh, uh, as EHP has just been mentioned, and I think probably the only uh, the way to get away from it is to eliminate extractable. <laughs> yeah, but on the other side, if we use uh, non-extractable plasticizers that are polymers, we have other problems. <laughs> so sure. Every, uh, uh, it's always a balancing. The problem is that there is not a clear protocol, so it's difficult for a commodity to find out the solution. Sure. This is not uh, a specialty product, uh, so high price, high study behind. Uh, there is uh, a big volume and low margin product, so uh, they ask if there is uh, something that is cheap uh, to be assessed in uh, in only one way. They, all the medical device producers produced uh, for more than 20 years with DHP with uh, no regulatory problems. Mm-hmm. And now they are starting to have problems because of reach, because, reach, uh, because of FDA and so on. Everyone is, uh, is putting uh, up the hand and saying, okay, yeah, take care. <laughs> and there are some problems, so uh, everyone is asking to a solution that is safe. But uh, There is an alternative approach. Uh, that would be a um, hybrid approach, I guess you'd call it. That would be to use EHG pesticide DC but use um, a technique which locks the plasticizer in place, such as the sulfonation test that was suggested by Krishna, um, published in Nature. And, and we, we looked at that. In fact, we published on that. We looked at that in terms of inflammatory response and found that it significantly moderated the inflammatory response to that material. And that's a very simple catalytic sulfonation process uh, that, that was outlined, uh, I think, in, in 1999 by Krishnan uh, from the Institute in India. Uh, and we recently looked at that um, from the inflammatory perspective and found that it, set, it worked very well. It's to migration of DAP and almost 100% uh, uh, eliminated the migration of DHP and significantly moderated the inflammatory response. The downside is it's hideous sulfur chemistry and it turns the material a strange yellow colour, um, which, um, which you know, I, I suggest might be called the golden standard. But, um, uh, it, it, 
you know, that opens up a whole new um, perspective. How so that that's a technology that works. There's no doubt that it works. It doesn't interfere with the mechanical properties of the material. Um, it inhibits the inflammatory response by inhibiting the migration. Uh, but I don't think the corporation could tell it. Because what the, clini what the clinicians want is clarity um, in, in their materials, you know, that are delivered to the clinic. And, uh, uh, I mean, that, that's been around 1919. I think actually it's 1998. Well, but there are some other things that must be taken account in this kind of process of grafting the plasticizer on the on the matrix of the polymer. Is the catalyst that you use that remains inside the the, 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 the compound? There is the problem of uh, to control the reaction, and there is also the price. Yeah, absolutely. It's connected to this because the problem is that. Um, Really, there is a, is a commodity market, uh, unfortunately. So a lot of uh, uh, million of tons of, of uh, PVC plastic material with a really low margin, with low technology. And so increasing of uh, uh, 0.1 euro can be an L. Yeah, I'm sure that's right. Sure that's right. No, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. And, you know... That's one of the big problems with, um, in my view, with um, suggesting a replacement for DHP. DHP plasticized is box. It has very good mechanical property, clarity. has everything the clinician wants. Um, but there is a residual issue of a pro-inflammatory effect. But I think that's manageable. Present, I'm sorry, my phone keeps going off. Um, but... Um, The day will come, I think, when we're forced to, we're forced to address it. Um, and I think what may precipitate that um, uh, uh, will be findings associated with multi-exposure. Yeah. I think that's what's going to precipitate a change. You know, the dialysis business is enormous. Global uh, repeat exposure in many million procedures per annum. Um, and I think that will, if, if these findings suggest increasing exposure uh, is, is a potentially injurious uh, mechanism, I think that will force a change. Much quicker than, a, than addressing a single exposure issue. As, as a procedure of non pvc solutions for medical, I would like to uh, you know, point out that uh, one of the world's largest producers of TD bags, bags for uh, dialysis, BATD, have been producing a non pvc system uh, and supplying that successfully in Europe and Asia uh, with based on polypropylene. Uh, and the big advantage, and the big advantage in these systems are uh, they are price competitive because you are working with a material that has 30% less density and you are able to reduce the film thickness about 50%. Hence, they are actually tough competitive. They are even saving the producers money. Uh, at the same time, giving, providing less weight to the hospital and at the same time working with a molecule that is not as sedative uh, and, and is still a, a very safe uh, molecule of hopefully being back from the 40s, 50s, and, and well documented also in the food industry. Yeah. Yeah. So there are, there are alternatives in the market that have successfully proven to also uh, replace the key part of the molecule uh, and it's a couple of years in this low cost market. Yeah. I recognize all of that. Yes, I also recognize that I have nine patents of PVC alternative materials, including one that we never got patents, and that was a, a bilayer tubing. We used PVC outside tubing with a layer of polyethylene on the inside. The trouble was the polyethylene did not prevent the migration of the DEHP. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So, is everyone uh, is everyone finished up with their questions? I've I've uh, 
The five to four, that's the timing. Mm-hmm. I'm playing now. Okay. I'll give you the heads up when the next case is published. Um, Certainly, yeah, I'd be delighted to, uh, to include that. Sam, thank you for getting us uh, this time together, and I appreciate all the uh, discussion Dr. Gurley has given us. It's a pleasure. Oh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks, everyone, for getting involved, and um, I will be circulating the, the report for publication, so I'd be pleased to get um, as many comments in as possible um, on the final. Well, I wouldn't say it's final, but it's, it'll be the first report, hopefully, of, of a number on this issue. So, um, so if anyone does um, hear anything from on the announcement from the um, the EC scientific group on this call for experts. The closing date is September the 24th, so it's, it's two weeks from now, and we'll be going to print after that. So um, please do let me know if you if you're going to get involved, or you know people who are who have who have been asked to be involved. I know that Hans uh, Gillickson has been asked to be involved, and I mentioned it to you, to, uh, Terry, as well, and my aunt, and to you, Lance. So um, please keep it posted, because I think that's sort of the headline area here that, that it is topical. So, mm-hmm. be good. Good. Okay, thanks, thanks everyone. I'll be in touch by email with, with the with draft. Thanks very much, Sam. Thanks, Bye. Bye now. Bye. Sam Allison. Has left the conference. Then she's up. Has left the conference. Kenny Gurley. Has left the conference. Has left the conference.